Heavy workload. Hardly any private life. Lots of responsibility. Always push to the limit. Whenever I ask doctors and nurses why they take all of that on, they often say, because what I do has meaning. Meaning for the lives of others, and therefore for my own life as well. As a global forum for medical specialists, we asked ourselves, how can we most effectively support the work, ambition, and dedication of these individuals? We sought out dialogue, we listened, and we understood. With a supportive exchange among medical professionals who network their knowledge around the globe, so that they maintain their expertise at the highest level for their entire lives. With disciplinary approaches that promote specialization without losing the perspective on medicine as a whole. With smart, modular concepts that are compatible with the busy lives of medical practitioners and nurses. With offerings whose contents provide answers for the reality of everyday medical life. With a growing perspective on trends that enables medical practitioners to already prepare for future challenges today. In close dialogue with renowned specialist companies that bear testimony to the quality of the offers. With inspiring forms of learning that don't just convey knowledge, but make it an experience for the senses. And with innovative teaching methods that prepare you not just for tests, but for life. Nurses and care assistants, physicians and hospital managers, and the people who work in the home health care services sector. All of those who teach and learn at the Escolop Academy share a passion for excellent medicine and very high personal standards. We invite you to join in a dialogue about health and medical care. A dialogue that is dedicated to life. Sharing knowledge learning something new, gaining confidence, thinking medicine, improving health. This is what drives people at Esculap Academies all around the world. And this is why we communicate with one another in a dialogue that is dedicated to life. All around the world, both speakers and participants, as well as researchers and practitioners meet at Esculap Academies in order to think medicine further ahead. Is there anything more valuable than a dialogue dedicated to life? The Escolab Academy connects people who want to know more to improve medical care. They are looking for a dialogue. We offer a dialogue dedicated to life. Dialogue dedicated to life. Dialogue Диалогу, dedicado a la vida. Диалог, посвященный жизни. Диалог, dedicado a la vida. Диалог, dedicado a la Диалог, dedicado a la Диалог, dedicado a vida. Диалог, Become part of this international, interdisciplinary dialogue at Esculap Academies all around the world. A dialogue dedicated to life. All right. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Escolab Academy once again. Welcome to the Escolab Academy medical education platform, a B. Brown company. My name is Linda Adrianti. On behalf of the Escolab Academy, B. Brown and Pain Institute of Indonesia, we would like to extend our thank you to everyone who have joined in again to this scientific digital dialogue of interventional pain update episode two. We would also like to greet everyone who have followed us all through the episode one last week. It was a very successful one, thank you. And also today we are honored to have our guest expert live all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil, Dr. Andre Manzano, PhD, FIPT Chips. 
And of course, today, Dr. Andrea, Andrea will be highlighting the agenda for the next, um, well, approximately one hour or one and, a half, one and a half hour, Dr. Andrea will be presenting and um, sharing his uh, material on ultrasound guided cervical procedures. And of course, there will be time for you to key in your questions during the session and led by the moderator for a panel discussion. All right. And also some important messages for you too. Don't forget that um, you can key in your questions in the Q&A section, in the Q&A section, all right? Not in the chat, anytime throughout the session. And also please be noted that all your microphone will be muted throughout the session, okay? And please be aware that this session will be also recorded. And here are brief um, faculty of today, Dr. Andre Manzano, the handsome one, of course, and the handsome Dr. Yossi Asmara. Okay, so without further ado, please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, our moderator for this afternoon, Dr. Yossi Asmara. Please, doctor. Okay. Thank you, Linda, for your time. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the YAP talk today, Yossi Asmara Pain Talk. We are going to talk about all the thing about pain intervention. Uh, today, we have uh, a guest from the Brazil. My, I met uh, Dr. Andre in 2016 when I took my examination, six examination. He was my examiner. So uh, thank God because of him, I passed the examination. So Dr. Andre will share us about uh, cervical procedure. This is the tough one in the interventional pain uh, procedure. So he will talk about it with all uh, his presentation. Uh, I will tell you all that uh, this is our second episode of uh, YAP Talk from Penn Institute of Indonesia, collaborate with Escolab Academy. Uh, we have uh, another episode uh, after this. We have we already uh, 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 have uh, many speakers from around the world who are very expert and uh, very good technique we have a good technique uh, with uh, ultrasound and uh, fluoroscopy uh, and the first one and and this episode uh, dr andre manzano i will i will i will read his uh, cv dr andre manzano now is physician at singular pain management center in brazil with anesthesia and pain management background he obtained his PhD degree in 2013 and became an FIPP in 2015 and now is a member of the World Institute of Pain Education Committee. Uh, he also served as an uh, examiner in the FIPP and SIPS exam. He specialized in training in fluoroscopic guided and also ultrasound guided minimal invasive interventional acute for acute and chronic pain procedure, as well as regional anesthesia technique. Um, he's been a teacher for Brazilian Singular Fellowship for two years, and now he also uh, a teacher in Pain School International. Okay, uh, it's too bad that now, because of technical problem, we cannot see a uh, handsome face of Andre Manzano, but I hope uh, the the presentation will uh, will will be very good. So uh, let's start it, Dr. Andre. Hi, Jose. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How Hello. are you? I'm excellent. <laughs> Except my built-in camera is not working. <laughs> I think you should buy another laptop, right? <laughs> uh, probably. I, I think my wife installed an IPP to detect ugly face and it blocked me. Oh, okay. Oh, but okay. but uh, I'm using uh, my cell phone with another no. email so I can appear on the screen. 
Not okay, okay, okay. Okay, it's not a big problem. I apologize for this. Okay. Okay, Dr. Andre, you can start it with your presentation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank and congratulate to you for the organization, yeah. you and Linda mainly. Uh, everybody can see my screen? My lecture? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. And now? Okay, now it's, yes. Great. So, well, I'll talk about cervical procedures uh, under ultrasound guidance. I think for cervical region, ultrasound is it's a must known tool. Okay, and talk to you why. I have nothing to disclose. So that's why we should learn ultrasound for cervical region. When, if you have a patient like this, if you use fluor, the only thing we'll, know, we'll see is this, under fluoro. Uh, but we have a lot of structures to see and we only can see under ultrasound guidance like this. We have muscles, we have veins, arteries, and nerves, lungs. So this is very important because our needle can grow through it and make harm to the patients, okay? That's why we must know um, ultrasound. Let's talk, let's talk about selective cervical nerve root block. This is a very, very useful procedure uh, in the clinical practice. So the main indications are cervical radicular pain due to disc herniation or foraminal stenosis, uh, upper limb herpes zoster or postherpetic neuralgia, and upper limb neuropathic pain, for example, uh, CRPS or other causes, or for upper limb anesthesia uh, if you want. Uh, I must advise for the new ASRA and Coagus protocol. So is the first one that divides the procedure into high risk bleeding, intermediate risk bleeding, and low risk bleeding. So cervical procedures are considered intermediate risk uh, procedures regarding the bleeding risk, okay? So our protocols will take this in count. For example, we don't have to, to stop any end sites for doing this procedure, okay? We have uh, to share with the, the cardiologist if the patient is under primary prophylaxis using uh, aspirin, okay? There's no uh, reason to stop phosphogesterase inhibitors like silosazole or dipidamol. And for some some anti-aggregants, for example, we have to stop clopidogrel uh, seven days before the procedures and seven to 10 days uh, prasugel, the, the most used uh, anti-aggregants like P2, epsilon 12 inhibitors. Uh, for varfarin and other anticoagulant, we have to guarantee that the NRI is under one point three equal or below 1.2 okay and for the newest anticoags like the bigotin and rivaroxaban or apixaban we have to to guarantee four days for the bigotran three days for rivaroxaban and three days for apixaban this is very important because hematoma can be very dangerous in this region okay uh, for unfractionate heparin, uh, six hours is enough. We have to stop six hours in advance. And for low weight heparin, in the prophylactic dose, 12 hours, in the therapeutic dose, one milligrams per kilo per day in, uh, in oxyparin, one day before the procedures. Okay? So this is the, the clinical panorama uh, for intervention techniques, techniques, 
regarding the cervical radicular pain, for example, due to a disc herniation is the most common cause, we have some options. Or we can perform a select nerve root block under ultrasound guidance, or we can perform an interlaminar epidural under fluoro guidance, uh, sometimes a transforaminal, although this is a little bit dangerous, and why not a transforaminal epidural under CT guidance. So we have all these options, okay? Uh, just to, to, to see, this is a picture of an interlaminar epidural under uh, fluoro guidance. So now you can see, you can't see many structures, and this, I think, it's a very dangerous procedure because a few millimeters ahead of the tip of the needle, we have the spinal cord, okay? This is a very, very uh, uh, dangerous procedure. Uh, we know from, from previous studies that we have defects in the closure of the ligament flava in these regions, so the loss of resistance sometimes is not reliable, okay? I'm always afraid of doing this, these procedures, although I, do, I, I perform it sometimes, okay? Uh, this is the, for the transforaminal under floral guidance. Usually, we touch here with our needle in the articular pillar. Okay, and then we advance. So uh, the vertebral artery is just ahead of the tip of our needle. This is very dangerous. So I touch the articular pillar here in the fetal aspect of it, and then I slip. Uh, inside the foramen like this. So ahead, in front of the tip of my needle is the vertebral artery. So it's a dangerous procedure. Um, most of the physicians do not perform it anymore. Okay? So we must keep in mind that we have the vertebral artery here and the radicular artery here and the the spinal segmental artery just just uh, uh, in the side of our needle. This is a very, very dangerous procedure. Uh, and ultrasound is very useful because ultrasound uh, prevents intra-arterial uh, puncture. Uh, we use uh, fluoroscopy detects when we also inside it, okay? So for example, uh, we have some two studies addressing uh, the prevalence of arteries in the path of our needle. So, sorry, this is in Portuguese, I'm, I'm really sorry. 10.36% we have uh, arteries in the path of our needle in C5, C6, and C5, C7 uh, levels, okay? I think you all are aware of severe complications that have been published using uh, transforaminal epidural. This is the first uh, case series, most of it under cervical region, and all of it using particulate corticosteroids, okay? So more than a half uh, in the cervical region. All of it, huge complications like paraplegia, medullary infarct, uh, death, uh, tetraplegia, and cerebellar herniation. So this is a very dangerous procedure. We must make it as safe as we can. So in 2015, uh, New England um, published a perspective of more 90 cases of severe complications. All of it with particulate steroids, okay? All of it. There's some mechanism of injury, for example, ischemia secondary to vasospasm, neurotoxicity of additives, steroid particular emboli, and also disruption of the radicular medullary arteries caused by the needle itself. Here we can see the radicular artery obstruction by the, the steroid. I think this is a very fancy, very interesting um, a study, uh, I apologize if there's any religions that is not uh, comfortable with this. They took some pigs and inject methylprednisolone into a vertebral artery 
dexamethasone and prednisolone. So here is a particular esteroid, and here is a non-particular esteroid, okay? So all of the pigs that had been injected with particulate esteroid failure to self-ventilate it after the procedure. And after the brain MRI that showed extensive sinus changes, and after the pig uh, death, they can show early neuronal necrosis in the histopathological exam. And for the pigs that had been injected with non-particulate esteroids, the most severe complications, it's only a delay in the recovery of the, uh, the ventilation, okay? No, no abnormalities in the brain MRI and normal histopathological findings uh, after the exam, okay? So we know that particulate esteroids can cause harm. Uh, there's another study they inject into the chromesteric arterial in the huts saline, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, and fiancinolone. So the last two ones are particulate esteroids. And they could document a decrease of the blood flow almost into the zero here with the fiancinolone and almost zero with methylprednisolone, okay? Because of uh, the emboli in these small arteries. So I suppose that the size of the particle is the size of the trouble. Here we can see the clear solution of dexamethasone. There's a solution of triancinolone, methylprednisolone, high concentrations, low concentration, and the combination of phosphate and acetate of betamethasone that is very uh, used worldwide, okay? So in this uh, slide, you can see how big are the particles of methylprednisolone and also triancinolone. Some of it reaching more than 1,000 microns, okay? And if you took a, a deep view inside the anatomy, sometimes the radicular artery is as thin as 1,000 microns. So one particle of this, have the, the, the power of obstruct these arteries. Um, make no mistake of it, okay? So uh, this is the average size of a triocinolone particle. This is the average size of a red blood cell. And this is the average size of a dexamethasone particle, very thin. But I'm talking about the average size because triocinolone can be as big as this. And this is real scale, real scale slide, okay? It can be very, very big. This is the text fort uh, leaded by Hetmerl. So um, every, every uh, organization, the 13 organizations uh, argued, agreed that particulate esteroids should not be used in cervical transforaminal injections, okay? And 11 from the 13 argued, agree that it should not be used as a first line for even lumbar transforaminal injection, okay? So let's uh, go deep inside uh, the ultrasound. Uh, with ultrasound, we do not perform it inside the foramen. We perform uh, in the cervical nerve root outside the foramen. So we must, um, make efforts to have a good spread of our solution, okay? Uh, we have this periradicular spread like this and crescent pattern. I will show it you after in more details. Uh, we have the perineural protruding pattern like this, it's also good. And of course, this is not good. This is an intramuscular spread and intramuscular pattern. It won't go on uh, help the patient. Okay, so I'll show this slide in more details after. So let's scan the cervical region. So here in blue is the probe. 
we can see in the seven level the posterior tubercle, the transverse process, and the vertebral artery in front of the C7 nerve root. If you turn on the color Doppler, you can see the vertebral artery, avoid it, of course. If we scan up, we'll find the posterior tubercle here, the anterior tubercle, and the posterior tubercle of C6, and a big, big nerve root, okay? And the muscle associated, anterior escalene and middle escalene. We can keep tracking higher, and we'll find a small tubercle of C5. It's not a big deal. It's, it's an easy scanning procedure. So is the study I show you before, you can see that in a few seconds. Here, with the pedineural and the crescent uh, spread, we have good outcomes. With intramuscular spread, we don't have good outcomes, and this is pretty obvious, okay? So crescent, crescent pattern, I will show you how it appears on the screen, is the, the best uh, pattern we can get. So we always go from posterior to anterior, okay? Here you can see uh, initial intramuscular spread. Look, it's not so good. So it advance a little bit the needle. And here's okay. The next one is a C7 nerve root block. I usually split the screen to keep the vertebral artery uh, in front of me. is the perineural spread. It's also good. Tiny movements because the cervical region is very dangerous. This is the perineural spread. And the last one is the one I like the most is a crescent spread. See how the C6 nerve root is bigger than the other one. This is the crescent spread. Okay, so this is how uh, we should perform the cervical uh, radicular uh, block. It's very important to always keep the tip of your needle on the screen. Don't try to find your needle moving it forward because you can harm the patients. If you're not seeing the tip of your needle, you stop the procedure and find it using the transducer, not trying to go further and further because when you see the tip of the needle, in this case, it can be too late, okay? Uh, I brought some studies here for you, some fancy studies. This is a study comparing ultrasound versus CT guided transferdominal injection. So selective cervical nerve root under ultrasound versus transferdominal CT guided block, okay? And we can see uh, the same results. There's no uh, difference in, in the in statistic analysis, but under ultrasound, we took fewer, uh, uh, less time to do the procedures. Two minutes against 10 minutes, and not to tell about the radiation, okay? This is a study comparing cervical nerve root uh, under ultrasound guidance versus interlaminar epidural under fluoral guidance. And you can see the same results in the two techniques. But in my personal opinion, under ultrasound guidance is safer if you do it properly. 
Uh, and this is a study comparing cervical nerve root under ultrasound guidance versus transforaminal epidural under fluoro guidance. And, and pretty, pretty the same results. The two curves is, uh, is the same, okay? Once again, in my opinion, ultrasound guided for this procedure is safer than for uh, the, the x-ray guidance. Let's talk a little bit about uh, cervical facets. Uh, we know that it's a very, very common uh, cause of pain uh, and it causes so, so much disability in, in the population, okay? So more than 30% of the population will have, will have a cervical pain uh, some, sometimes in one year, okay? Uh, regarding the cause of the chronic cervical pain, the cervical facets are responsible for more than half of the cause, okay? So when we compare cervical to, to thoracic and lumbar region, cervical facets is the leading cause of cervical chronic pain. Just uh, anatomic over overview, it's a true synovial joints. Here we can see uh, the capsule and the and the joint itself. So here's the superior, superior uh, process and the inferior process here, okay? And the innervation is very important because most of the procedures, we target the innervation itself. So the C2, C3 facet joint is innervated by the third occipital nerve and the articulations under it C3 to C7 are innervated by the middle branch of ramus dorsalis above and below uh, the joint. So anatomically, we know that this uh, middle branch pass usually in the centroid of this articular pillar here. So when you do it under a floral, we'll reach that position, uh, except for the third occipital nerve, that is a cartoon drawing here, that it pass uh, above the C2, C3 nerve root, so we can reach it between these two, uh, uh, between the, this, this uh, articulation here, okay? This is a bipolar radio frequency under uh, floral guidance. So for middle branch, we put our needles in the centroid of this articular pillar like this, okay? This is for third occipital nerve, C3 middle branch, C4 middle branch, C5 middle branch, and C6 middle branch. And this is how we perform it under ultrasound guidance. Basically, we have two techniques. We have the wap mu technique, uh, scanning, uh, in the, the short axis of the articular pillar like this. First of all, we can find the mastoid. Here's the mastoid. And the first joint we can see is the C2, C3 joint, okay? C1, C2 will be here, but it's very, very difficult uh, to see, okay? The first joint you can see is the C2, C3 joint. And in the top of it, I'll show you in a few seconds. Here, C2, C3. In the top of it, we have the third occipital nerve. So we can put a needle here and very easily we can block it. Okay, so if you scan down, here the C3 middle branch in the valley, we can keep tracking down. looking for the valley. The next one, of course, is the C4. And if you go down, and C5, C6, and so on. In this approach, you go out of plane approach, always, from anterior to posterior, because if you, if you miss the, your target 
from anterior to posterior, the only thing you're gonna reach is muscle, okay? Never from, from posterior to anterior, always from anterior to posterior. So out of plane, all we can see is the tissue being disturbed by our needle. And we have the other approach described by Finlayson. This is my favorite approach, uh, I confess. So here we can see the posterior tubercle. This is the articular pillar and the lamina. And our target is on the top of the articular pillar, okay? So here's how we scan. We can find the nerve roots and go posterior. Here we can see, yes, the posterior tubercle, the nerve root in front of it, the articular pillar and the lamina. And our target will be on the top of the articular pillar. Okay? From posterior to anterior, be careful not to go so anterior because if you don't keep the posterior tubercle the screen, you can even touch the nerve root if you go so much with your needle. Okay. This is how Finn Lyson described it in the first time. And we have a modified technique that we can confirm the position in the short axis, confirming that our needle is on the valley. Okay? It seems to be easy, but if you don't master the technique, Eggy uh, from Hungary uh, led a study. I participate of this study. Uh, she sent it for publication uh, in a few days that show that many skilled physicians even miss level or uh, put the needle in dangerous places, sometimes into the spinal cord. So master the technique before making uh, cervical procedures. Let's talk a little bit about Estalate ganglion block. It's a very useful block in the clinical practice. The main indications are head and neck pain syndromes, like for example, zoster or positive pain neuralgia or a cancer related pain or upper limb pain syndromes like CRPS or other causes of, uh, of neuropathic pain. So we know that the isolated ganglion uh, lies usually between C7 and T1, is the inferior uh, cervical ganglion, okay? Usually in anterior lateral aspect of the longus coli muscle, okay? So this is C7, the longus coli muscle here, the isolate ganglion, the vertebral artery, and the carotid artery here, okay? So, uh, Michael Goldfield make uh, a very interesting study uh, with seven healthy volunteers, 10 isolate ganglion injections with five cc's of uh, solution uh, in the C6 level. And after fluoro assessment, they, uh, he can see that the solution is spread even to T2, sometimes to C2, okay, depending uh, if you, it's very, in, very inside the fascial plane, the solution can spread so much, okay? And this is a very tricky because, uh, for example, you can put your needle here in C6 or C7, have your solution spread even to T2 or T3, but if you carry out a radio frequency here, you will burn only this aspect, okay, sorry, let's go back here. We burn it only here. So this more um, widespread block can make, for example, a false positive because it can block even the thoracic uh, sympathetic chain, okay? And even the medium cervical uh, ganglion, usually C6 or C5, and sometimes the upper, uh, cervical ganglion. 
So this is how we perform under uh, fluoro guidance. This is my partner Fabricio Bloch. He's a master of fluoro, uh, fluoro techniques. So we usually reach uh, the junction of the vertebral body with the transverse process at C7 level, okay? So when you see the spread of the contrast media is the longus coli spread, okay? So here we can imagine how many structures we cannot see under uh, fluoro guidance, under X-ray guidance, okay? So that's how we perform under installate guidance, it's, sorry, sorry, under ultrasound guidance. So many structures to see, okay? We'll stop it to see it clearly. So thyroid, esophagus, carotid, jugular vein, trachea, the anterior tubercle, the posterior tubercle, this is C6, nerve root, longus captis, anterior escalene muscle, and this is the longus coli muscle, okay? We can uh, scan down to find C7 level. And of course, we see the vertebral artery in front of the nerve root. C7 and the vertebral artery and the longus coli, and this is our target. Uh, I guess, although in ultrasound sometimes you cannot affirm that this structure here can be uh, the isolate ganglia itself. We know it's big sometimes, 2.5, three centimeters, okay? It's not so common to see it clear like this. So the vertebral artery, in plane approach, and this is the good spread of our local anesthetic solution. Okay, sometimes it's not so easy like this. For example. Here we can see how tricky is the procedure because my needle will come from here to here and we have arteries and veins all over the path. So we can do it out of plane. Like this, okay? Most of the case I perform an in-plane approach. Uh, this is uh, the Horner syndrome. Here we can see ptosis, meiosis, the, the redness of the eye, and of course we cannot see any drosis here, but this is a very beautiful uh, Horner syndrome that is uh, desired after this sort of procedure. Okay, let's go to greater occipital nerve. This is a very, very useful procedure uh, for cervical pain and even from some kind of redakes. This is a very interesting study. It's a must read study showing that we have basically six points of compression of the occipital nerve, the great occipital nerve. I'll go through all of it, okay? The first point is the most important point is through the fascia band between the oblique cactus and the semispinalis muscles, usually at C2 level. This is where I perform most of the procedures, okay? So between these two muscles. The point two is the entrance of the semispinalis muscle. The point three is the exit from the semispinalis muscle. The point four is the entrance uh, into the trape trapezius muscle. Uh, the point five is through uh, the trapezius insertion. And the point six is uh, compressed by the occipital artery. So we always start the scanning from the occipital region. It's a very uh, easy to scan. 
So here we can see I'll put labels on it. We scan down to find C1 uh, arc. So in the C1 arc, we'll see this kind of spinous process that is unique, like this. Only one spike, okay? So the muscles uh, attach it on it. So now we have to go down until we find C2. And we will recognize C2 under ultrasound guidance when you find this bifid spinous process of C2, like this. We have two spikes here, okay? And then have the trapezius muscles, the semispinalis, and the oblique capsis inferior muscles. At this point, uh, we tilt a little bit to lateral and oblique positions, like you can see here in the cartoon drawing, okay? Like this. To track the inferior oblique muscle in the long axis. So the splenius, the semispinalis, and the oblique inferior capsis. And here we can see the great, greater occipital nerve. We can't approach it from lateral to medial or from medial to lateral. Please, always keep the tip of our needle into the screen because we have some described uh, complications, even like spinal cord injections going from lateral to medial, okay? So here's my needle. And I will inject between the two muscles. Okay, that's a very, very useful procedure. And to finish, uh, um, a very uncommon case, a clinical scenario, a patient that came to me, 15 years old, female, with a metastatic melanoma, with diaphragm involvement. She suffered from severe abdominal pain related to diaphragm cramps. She can barely breathe because of these cramps. And I decide to make a phrenic denervation. So here we can see the anterior tubercle, the posterior tubercle, C6 the root, the anterior scalene, sternocleidomastoid, and here is the phrenic nerve. I won't show this, but if you scan up the phrenic nerve, we must see it joining the C4 uh, nerve root, okay? Because it's the efference of the phrenic nerve. In plane approach. With the motor simulation, the patient had uh, diaphragm contractions. In the sensory simulation, she referred abdominal discomfort. And then we burn it, and the patient lived more uh, three months without pain. Just to keep in mind, the sensory innervation of diaphragm is from the vagus nerve. My intention here was to paralyze the, the diaphragm because the pain was due to muscle contractions, okay? And that's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the lecture and I'm available for any questions you have. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you, Andre. Because okay, thank you, Andrew. Now, now we can see your face. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yes. Hi, now, okay.
I'm, okay, I'm in the you, farm. <laughs> you're in the farm? Right I'm now? in the farm, yes. Yes, my, my okay. family is in the farm since the beginning of the, the pandemic. We are here from uh, 100 days. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I see in your Facebook and Instagram with yeah. the horse and, 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 and another thing that. <laughs> okay, we have now oh, a question for you. Okay. Ah, first one from my friend Tatiana Bravo from Brazil. Okay, she asks which needle and how much the volume for selective cervical nerve root block? Well, I use a 22 gauge quink needle for this kind of block. Um, usually, I do not use uh, sonovisible needles because it's a bit expensive in Brazil. But <laughs> if available, I recommend because it makes the navigation easier. And regarding the solution, I use uh, five cc's of 0.2% of ropivacaine plus 10 milligrams of the Oh, 5 cc ropivacaine and okay. dexamethasone. Dexamethasone. Yes, avoid particulate steroids in this region. Um, and then the other uh, question, uh, okay, from Dr. Poppy Chandra from Indonesia, do we use pure dexamethasone for cervical uh, selective nerve root block or dilute it with normal saline? Can we mix it with lidocaine and the top volume for every level uh, in cervical? Oh, it's the same, but the same spirit. Okay, I, I, I think it's good. I prefer using uh, long action uh, local like ropivacaine, but I think it's totally okay. Oh, lidocaine is okay? Totally okay with lidocaine? Would you use it? I think, I think uh, it's okay. I prefer uh, ropivacaine because it's it lasts longer, but it's okay using lidocaine. Uh, I have a question for you. <laughs> Can we do the intervention for the disc, cervical disc, using ultrasound? Yeah, this is a very important question. This is a very important question. I have a friend, uh, I think you know it, uh, Stanley Lee. This ah, guy is Stanley. awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This guy is awesome. It's a monster. He can perform <laughs> any procedure under ultrasound guidance. Okay. But I really do not recommend from, for average skilled physicians. Myself, I'm not comfortable doing interdisco procedures under ultrasound guidance. No even lumbar or cervical. For example, uh, we have isolate ganglion. We can perform it under fluoro or under ultrasound guidance. It's much safer under ultrasound guidance, of course, for obvious reason. And this is the opposite with the interdisco procedure, in my opinion. It's safer under, um, under fluoro guidance. I think a very fancy way to do it, it's do it, is under dual guidance. But I won't recommend, yes, dual guidance use, using ultrasound and fluoro and because then you can see uh, you can see vessels, nerves under ultrasound, but you can see clearly the anatomy of the, the bones using x-ray. Um, I know some guys can do it. Actually, once I saw Stanley doing a cervical disc injection itself, Seated, yes. he showed it to yeah. me, but he's, <laughs> he's awesome. He's an outlier. Yes. Awesome and a little bit crazy. <laughs> Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> what very awesome. Um, I, I, love, I, love to see he, I love to see he teaching. He's awesome. Yes, yes, yes. I know it. Okay. Oh, so many questions. I think another question from... Dr. John from Indonesia. It's Horner syndrome 
always present do the spell block for what sorry is Horner syndrome always present due to stellate block? So if you in do the stellate block, it's always okay. always Horner syndrome or not? In, in a in the good block, yes. In a good block, yes. Yes. Uh, how about if you you do the uh, RF or pass RF or uh, stellate ganglion? Do you use the stimulation or something like that to make sure that you are on the right target? I, I use simulations to see if I'm not in the wrong target. Oh, okay. I, I use motor simulations to see if I'm not so close to the nerve root, so avoid upper limb contractions. And I use motor simulations asking the patients to, to talk to me um using uh saying uh, an open vocal like uh to see if it doesn't change uh the sound because we can be close uh to to the laryngeal recurrent uh, nerve oh, okay. we don't have a sensory reliable stimulation yeah. for the estalate ganglion itself and if you do the rf uh, ablation for the stellate ganglion you do only one puncture or you direct it, direct it, it the needle to other direction only one direction or other direction truth be told i'm very skeptical about this procedure i'll yeah. tell you why because um well i think you do it under ultrasound guidance okay yeah yeah how many times you see clearly the isolate ganglion <laughs> Not much. Not not so not so many. Okay. Not so many. Usually, we inject into the fascial plane of the longus coli. Okay. Yeah. So, if you do an RF, probably you're not reaching the isolate ganglion because the the RF lesion is so small. You probably sometimes burn the sympathetic chain itself, not the ganglion. Okay. Mm. Uh, but when I perform it, I do only one lesion and I'll tell you why. Because after the, before the first lesion, I always inject local. And after I inject local, I cannot have a re reliable stimulation for the other structures. So I'm afraid to be close to the nerve root in the second lesion and make harm to the patient. So I only perform one lesion. Oh, okay. Okay, just, so you just do the one lesion for the RF. Yes. Uh, okay, the other question is from Dr. Saif Saad. Uh, the indication of phrenic nerve block. Well, uh, the most indication of this of for recalcitrant hiccups. Ah. Oh. Yes. Uh, this case I perform only once for pain, and this is a specific case of melanoma. But most of the procedures are done to treat uh, hiccups. I do. I, I do the. I do the phrenic nerve block for the hiccup once in my practice, but it's fail. <laughs> it failed. Yeah, it failed. It failed. Yeah. But it's failed. Yeah, it's, it's, so, it's not easy to treat. I agree. It's not easy to treat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can pulse it after if you want. You can. Yeah, pulse yeah. It. I do the post RF for that, but yeah. it's failed. Okay, that's it. And again, Doctor Popi. And the there. other, the other thing is good for this is vagus stimulation. Vagus stimulation. Phrenic block ablation. For how many cycle and for what degree every cycle? I think it's for phrenic nerve ablation. Yeah, I think it's related to RF maybe. Yeah, well, truth be told, I did it only once for this patient, and I burned it under 80 degrees for two minutes, only one lesion. Only one lesion. You do the thermal yeah. or pulse? I burn it. Oh, you burn it. Okay. Uh, 
And then the other thing is Dr. Untung from Jaka from Indonesia. What the caution for adverse event of this procedure? Oh, hmm. the complication. I, I think. I didn't understand yeah. the question. Yeah, I think I think what the complication that must uh, uh, happen in the cervical procedure. Uh, the complications. Well, uh, of course, infection hematoma is is something we must be uh, aware of. But I think the biggest complications we can have is vertebral artery injection. But we can see the vertebral artery, so this is very rare. Okay. Uh, nerve root lesion because sometimes you cannot see the tip of your needle and it's very, very common to try to see it going forward. So I'm not seeing the needle, so I go forward to see it and this is very dangerous, okay? So wow. that's why ultrasound uh, doesn't uh, decrease anesthesia complication because, uh. because of some reasons. First of all, because some guys are doing it with no mastering the technique, without mastering the technique. Some guys are trying to make injections very, very close to the nerve root and it's not necessary to, very, to be very, very close to the nerve root. Uh, making epineural injections, perineural injections and something like this. For uh, intrafascial blocks, we must be aware of local anesthetic uh, toxicity because sometimes we are into the muscle and the absorption is very quick. Okay? Oh, okay. Okay, and then we still have four questions. Okay, Dr. Livia Albergaria, do you think it is safe to do greater occipital block to head it related to COVID? <laughs> <laughs> Related to COVID nineteen. <laughs> Scoop, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't uh, understand. Do you think it's safe to do greater occipital block or headache? Yeah, related to COVID nineteen. Oh well, actually, now I got it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, <laughs> these kind of blocks are very tricky. We we can have some good results. I can I can't see a very um, biological reason for it, but I think we can try. I think we can try. It's a very simple block. Uh, for example, we have some some studies addressing cervical uh, sorry, a great occipital nerve blocks for post dura puncture or headaches, for example, uh, or migraine, or a yes, lot of them. So I think I can try. I think I can try. Yeah. Okay, okay. This is from Doctor Nyoman. If you block or ablate uh, or ablated the phrenic nerve, uh, is it will disturb the patient respiratory? Yes, for sure, because yeah. we're gonna have a diaphragmic palsy. Yes, this is this is very important. Of okay. course, we will. will. That? So then yeah, I yeah. will uh, I will explain why I did it in that patient. Yes. Uh, uh, that patient has so severe cramps in the diaphragm. Uh, yeah. Her respiratory was already depressed because of it. He can, she can barely breathe because of the cramps. So in that case, I'm not worried with this. But uh, okay. I, w I wouldn't burn it, for example, for hiccups. Of course not. Okay. Okay. That's all the questions. Linda, do we still have time? Yes, doctor. Still have time? Yes, doctor. Still have time? Yeah. You can go yeah. ahead. Okay. Is there any other question? I will read again. No, no. Oh, another question. Can we use a person to guide play the frequency of Oh, this is sure. Can we use can we use ultrasound to guide radiofrequency ablation for medial branch or DRG? For medial branch, yes. Medial for DRG, yes. no. For, for medial yes. branch, yes, no. of course. 
for DRG? No, because DRG is inside the neural foramen and we can't go inside the neural foramen under ultrasound guidance. It's not safe. It's not safe. Okay. Ah, this you is can, good. You can question. perform pulse it in the cervical nerve root outside the foramen, but not in the DRG. Uh, okay, this is a good question. They, uh, Dr. Muhammad Jalal, he want to, he asked you the tips and trick to make the needle clear when we do the cervical intervention with ultrasound. Uh, okay. Uh, well, we have some, some tricks. Uh, the first trick, let me see, I'll take a pen here. Okay. Let me take something here, just a little. Okay. This is and this is the needle, okay? So if I bend the transducer toward the needle, I will see it more, more clearly, okay? Because the, the, the ultrasound wave will touch the transducer, the, sorry, the, the needle, and come back to the transducer. If I do like this, the ultrasound will go from here to here, and then we will return outside the transducer, like this. If the transducer is like this, the ultrasound wave will reflect into the transducer. So this is very important, okay? A little tilt um, toward the needle, okay? And of course, we must keep in mind that the wave, it's a little bit a thinny, thinny wave, well, like one millimeters. So we have to be very parallel to the, the, the ultrasound wave, okay? Very, very parallel. Well, the other tip is using uh, sono visible needles. That's it. It's not a big deal. It's a matter please of... Have, uh, please, bend needle. No, I don't use bent needles. Only for deep structures like uh, pudendo nerve blocks. For superficial, I don't use. Oh, you don't Aggie. use it. Aggie, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Aggie Aggie use it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Aggie. Last time when he visited Indonesia, uh, we, yeah. we discussed about it. So he used the bent needle for it. So it's maybe another tip for the... I use, for, I use for deep structures. I use for oh, deep. You, you just for deep structures. Okay, I will set this is another question. Okay, Dr. Mia, can we do phrenic block on patient with compromised pulmonary function? Wow, well, um, this is a tough question. Is this is the same uh, the same rational for for brachial plexus block? Is the same rational if you do. A, bracho, a brachioplexus block in the patient with uh, low pulmonary function, we will depress that side uh, diaphragm, of course. Yeah, yeah. We will. So, uh, that is the same rational. Yes. Okay. I think it's finished at the question all from the participant. I will read it again. No, 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 no other question. Okay. Yes, I think I think it's, it is all. So uh, I want to say that that's a fairly beautiful presentation from you, Andre, and very clear. Thank you, my friend. And very colorful. And very colorful. <laughs> and Brazilians very colorful. like color. Like colors. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the Brazilians like colors, so it's very colorful, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, after after this episode, I uh, the for the participant, uh, we have uh, another part episode next is I will invite Aggie, Dr. Agnes Togiska, uh, from Hungary. Uh, she will talk about regenerative therapy, and after Aggie, uh, Professor Sudi Diwan from United States. We'll also talk uh, in this job talk 
the topic I think about the regenerative therapy for the discogenic pain. Uh, I hope all the participants can save the date for the next topic. Uh, it will be a great lecture from Agi and also from uh, Professor Sudil. And for Andre, big thanks for you, Andre. I really appreciate uh, that you share your knowledge, that you share your time uh, in this uh, pandemic to share all your knowledge about ultrasound to all the participants, especially for uh, Indonesian doctors. It's very so beautiful. Thank you so yes. much for your kind invitation, my friend. I'm always available for you. Yes, I think uh, after the pan after the pandemic, we will have Dr. Andre come to Indonesia. <laughs> uh, right, Andre. Such, it's a, be a big pleasure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Selinda, is it all right? Oh, uh, yes. I give it back wow. to you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yossi, Dr. Andre. Big applause, everyone. From <laughs> well, Dr. That's Andrea, I must say that, well, the participants say you made it look so easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a great presentation, Dr. Andrea. Thank you so much. And Thank you, Linda. Thank you for all the support. You're welcome. And as Dr. Yossi said, we hope to have you in Indonesia after all this over. I hope. <laughs> Okay, so everyone, um, before we leave, we would like to encourage you to participate in our polling or uh, giving us your feedback of today's session. So um, just in a few seconds in the screen in front of you, uh, there will be polling from uh, our team. So you can fill in just a few questions that you can fill in right now. Yeah, and thank you for those who have submitted. All right, and also don't forget to stay tuned on the 6th of July with Dr. Aggie, Agnes Togichka. She will be presenting yes. about regener regenerative therapy to Dr. Yossi also in uh, Yossi Asmara Pain Talk on 6th of July. That, that would be on Monday, okay? And um, don't forget to stay tuned and register. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Andre, Dr. Yossi. We'll see you next week. On behalf of the Escolab Academy and also B. Brown and Pain Institute of Indonesia, we would like to thank you all participants for joining in. Thank you to all the crews in the scene. Thank you so much from the um, Academy in Asia Pacific also for supporting us. Stay tuned till the next episode. Goodbye. Have a safe Saturday evening and morning. And goodbye. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Keep Bye. safe. Thank you, Bye.